you know, the purpose of this is really to kind of provide a um, guide or maybe, um, you know, some, some, some insight as to what you really should be getting ready for and what you should be really getting uh, ready to get asked when it comes to uh, your third-party vendors, specifically in the appraisal management space that, you know, we deal with. So just to kind of give you guys a heads up, this, this will be recorded, and then this will... Uh, the slides will be emailed to you. So we'll have a recording uh, available on our YouTube channel. And then um, we will do a uh, email you the slides for these so you can go through them individually. Uh, this is not designed to give you all the answers. Um, this is really designed to maybe start asking the right questions and maybe start uh, you know, really realizing, you know, what's coming down a path um, and or what's really not necessarily coming down a path, but what you should currently be doing uh, for your regulatory assessments. I've done, you know, personally all, you know, dealt with all types of various audits from, from different investors and different lenders. And, and it's really something specifically the third-party oversight that most lenders are just not ready to deal with and not ready to... Um, not ready to handle, and even from personal experience, there's been a lot of questions that I've at, been asked and things that I've gone through in processes that I've, we've had a hard time having good answers and dealing with. So what this is going to do is really provide some good insight and some expertise from somebody who has kind of direct experience doing this and hopefully provide some value to you guys uh, to help you in this lending, you know, compliance world. So, you know, this is really based on my experience of what you should be ready for and dealing with lenders and investors directly. Some of the stuff is really simple, and then some of the stuff is a lot more complicated probably than you thought. But again, this is just kind of a way to, to help. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I try to keep these short. So this should be about 30 minutes. We're going to leave some, some, some time for questions. Um, you know, again, this is being recorded, and I'll provide my personal email information to everybody so that you can email me, and I will try to get back to you. Um, sometimes it's a little difficult, but if I can get back to you personally, I'll have somebody on my staff get back to you. But again, thank you so much, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first thing is the um, compliance. So when it comes to the specific appraisal management space, uh, there's a lot of various things that come to compliance when, it, when it's uh, uh, there's a lot of various things when it comes to compliance that you have to follow regardless if you're a lender that manages this process in-house or you use an AMC. All of them need basically the answers to these questions. The AMC's licensing stuff obviously is, is specific to a uh, lender, I mean it's specific to an AMC but everything else needs to be handled by you guys. Um, so things like appraiser independence, selection of the appraisers, engagement letters, uh, appraiser qualification, geographic competency, customary reasonable fees, mandatory report, reporting, exclusionary list, the reviewing of appraisals, the reviewer qualifications, the depth of the reviews, resolution of deficiencies, documentation of reviews, state licensing or specific to AMCs, and then the general business policies. All these things need to be covered by you guys, regardless if you manage the process in-house or if you use a third-party AMC. You're held accountable by the, regulator, by the regulators for having these processes in place. Most good third-party providers would be able to do this for you, but uh, this is a little more in-depth than what most people really think. Um, and we're going to go ahead and kind of cover that as, as, as really good as I can. All right, so let's go ahead and get into these. So appraisers and dependents. And what this is going to do, and what I'm going to try to do and put it in context and frame this for you guys, is really got to start thinking about your own internal processes. So one of the things uh, specific about appraisal independence is, is the first question, what are your policies and procedures? Uh, most of these refer to a third-party AMC, but at the same time, you do need to have your own third, so whether you need to have your own policy and procedure. So whether that's everything goes through a third-party AMC, that's fine. But at the same time, you need to understand what they have. Um, uh, you need to understand what they have. Uh, and then do they have or do you have a compliant tracking process, meaning how do you know that the um, appraisal uh, 
uh, management process and appraisal independent process is compliant. One of the things required by the CFPB is a compliant tracking, compliant management system that can track and monitor complaints, state regulatory licenses, all those different things. And that is very much a part of not only the disciplinary actions and appraisal regulations, but also the appraiser independence. You want to know how many violations you encountered, were these if it's just investigate, explain how you proactively identify potential violations. Do you monitor communication with appraisers from your staff? And how do you track and monitor revision requests for new comparables? How do you handle communication and allow notes from clients to vendors? This all needs to be very well documented with a way of actually catching something. Great example is a lot of the lender clients and banks that we use, uh, when you email them and you put like a keyword in there, it goes to a secure email system that's monitored and tracks the flag. Very similar to that. Like in our system, if you put certain keywords as a client notes, we get those first. Uh, we have a list of words and then also we have kind of an approval process um, if there's too many things that come up. Uh, one of the things that you really want to look at is the baseline minimum is tracking and identifying. I mean, do you have a way to identify what trigger do you have in place. Sometimes it could be value rebuttals or appraisal rebuttals. Sometimes it could be multiple revisions. Sometimes it could be like I know on our side when um, there's a change in value. So if there's an appraisal rebuttal and there's a change in value, we really investigate that and make sure that everything. And then what do you do? Meaning you, do you open a case and close the case internally? And then how do you monitor that? So can you go back and say that John Smith appraiser had 16 violations over the past six months and uh, you know all of them cleared or did he have anyone and that's very very important because what you need to do is show that you have your controls in place and everything's documented one of the one of the biggest red flags that I would say from a third-party vendors perspective is how many violations have you encountered and how do you proactively identify potential violations there are going to be violations at some level. So it's just going to be. There's just no way around it. Um, you know, boxers get punched in the face. It's just going to happen. So in the mortgage business, in the lending business, if you're doing a double volume, you're going to have some type of violations over a period of a couple months. So how do they get monitored? How do they get tracked? How can you get reporting on them? is very, 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 very important. And something as simple as the revision requests and the value rebuttals, which seems so simple, is very important because that at least begins the process. Some of the more complicated stuff like monitoring appraisal values and things like that and reporting on that gets a little more complex from a software standpoint, but it's just baseline. Um, engagement letters. So a uh, copy of engagement letters sent to the appraisers that you're engaging them to complete a specific assignment, content of the engagement letter, uh, the use path requirements addressed in the engagement letter, and that uh, the minimum appraisal content. Most lenders do a pretty decent job of giving the requirements for an appraisal to do an appraisal for them, on a, you know, an appraisal for them. But when it comes to addressing these specifics as the definition of market value used, pretty much going to be just underlying this. Fannie Mae and HUD, that's, that's going to be your answer. Uh, pretty much 100% of the time. When it comes to uh, minimum appraisal content, most lenders just pick Fannie Mae guidelines, um, which I don't necessarily disagree with. Um, I think that Fannie Mae guidelines are a very accurate assessment. I would probably venture to say that you should um, have your specific overlays that um, address uh, that address your specific business practices, whether it's rule lending, whether that's minimum comparable requirements. And what you really want to do is just show them that, you know, and one of the things that we do with our clients is say, okay, here's the problems that we're seeing. We're going to adjust the minimum appraisal content to reflect fixing the problem, which typically does not um, have things to do with specific Fannie Mae guidelines. So that typically has to do with more your underwriters and your underwriter training. So we want to really look at those um, and make sure that the engagement letter is not only meeting use path requirements, 
but also the minimum appraisal content, which is probably Fannie Mae with FHA, but also some of your lender-specific overlays. Um, appraiser qualifications. So that's a big thing. So the appraiser policies and procedures, application process to get on the panel, copy of the application, require a resume and letter of good standing, work samples, minimum criteria. And so, you know, just to give you our personal requirements, um, you know, which I don't necessarily are the best, but it's what, you know, we come up with is um, we do have a very comprehensive application process where we check the appraisal subcommittee, we check all investors' blacklists, um, that application gets stored in a, in a database that's original so that we can go back, if they make any modifications, we can go back and view the different versions of that. Uh, we do require a resume. We used to require a letter of good standing. Uh, the letter of good standing is kind of actually hard to get. they got to get that from the state. They're only valid for 90 days. They cost the appraisers like 20, 30 bucks. It's the equivalent of a mini background check for the certain extent to the appraisers, but it doesn't um, doesn't go into any other states. So it just says that the letters their their license isn't good standing with that specific state. We stopped requiring it because there was too many issues with some appraisers not wanting to provide it in certain states because they require you know sometimes it's ninety days before you get it back. So. Uh, work samples. Most lenders um, have stopped asking because you know every appraiser can provide really good work samples, but uh, you do want a minimum criteria. And what a, min a good minimum criteria is, is that we give them a shot. So having a process in place, and to give you ours, is 10 orders. We review those 10 orders uh, in full. If you do a good job, you meet the turnaround requirements, you meet the quality requirements, you're responsive, you're in the rotation. If you kind of screw up those 10, then we know you're not going to do a good job. It's, we ha there's a risk factor with those and then you can be put on probation so if you really look at it from a work so plan work so workflow standpoint you have an appraiser who comes on board you check the appraisal subcommittee you check to make sure their license is good standing you check you know all the investors blacklist after all that you get a resume you get all the licenses you get all the coverage area and then you give them a couple sample orders in areas that he um, want it, you know, put it in his coverage area and that he's competent to do, and then you take it from there. Now, we do have some specific overlays, such as client-specific training, such as, um, you know, um, previous work file that we have the ability to scan and upload and, and do reporting on, but that's a little more technology-driven and specific to us rather than something, not that many people have that, so it's not something that I would try to use as a realistic for most, but again, you just want to make sure that you have minimum you know, criteria in place and that you have specifics. Geographic competency. Now this is the you know $64,000 question. It's how do you know that the appraiser is competent to do this appraisal? Um, so you need a policy and procedures to this. And, and the simple formula is he's done appraisals before and we know he's good. That's really simple. Uh, accomplishing that if you don't have a lot of experience with this appraiser is somewhat difficult. We took the route of previous work, I mean work files, so we know what he's done previously, and then we know how on the work that he did for us, the scores associated with those appraisals. So if we know you do well in this particular particular area, you've done 50 appraisals for us. We know you're going to be probably pretty good. Um, this is really hard to determine pre-assignment when you're getting somebody first going and you need to have something like a manual review in place or you know a distance requirement or maybe you know com complexity requirements. Just some way of verifying it. The simplest is we give them 10 appraisals in specific market areas. We score those appraisals. That score goes into his profile. We use that score to update continually as far as where this appraiser is good long term. And um, that goes into an overall competency score for a specific, specific assignment. That's got to be software based. So our software, no problem. Um, doing that manually is a little more complicated, but you, you could score. You could 
put it in there. You know, this appraiser sent 22 files in you know Montgomery County, Maryland, and he's done well on those 22 files. And then in Prince George's County, he doesn't do as well. So he's not. He's more competent in Montgomery County. Well, compared to all his other vendors that we have to do Montgomery County, this is the most competent appraiser. Uh, relatively simple, but not necessarily the easiest. Um, customary reasonable fees. This is a this is a big thing um, because really simple. You know, we're, any AMC or any lender who's making money off the appraisals is, is paying the appraiser less than they're charging, right? So that's simple. And dealing with the customary reasonable fee policies and procedures, there's really two ways to go about it. There's one fee survey model, which, um, you know, there's been some surveys published, published information. I mean, you know, I think Alamo had one a couple of years ago, and there's some, um, there's some, you know, online stuff you can do, maybe polling your appraisers and stuff like that. But uh, most people go is, is in presumption one and presumption two is, presumption two is our, your own formula. And so and what we do is really allow appraisers to set their own fees, take the average of those fees, the mean and the mode of those fees, and then set up triggers to associate the various fees within their market. So if we had an appraisal in Montgomery County, Maryland, we know the average medium mode. Anything that is within a 10% variance of the average and medium mode, we get a trigger to know. Because the appraisers set their fees, it's within a reasonable range, we have our own documented formula, and it's compliant with presumption two. Um, that has worked well, it's a little complicated from a software technology standpoint. And it took us a while to come up with something that would work property specific. Um, but it's one way to do it. I've seen various ways where, you know, they have the, I don't like this um, personally, but I've seen one ways where some AMCs or some lenders put in a little disclosure um, that says, you know, this is the customary reasonable fee. Um, and by accepting this, you do that, and it's like, and basically what they're doing is saying, we're willing to pay you this, if you accept that, you know, that's the customary reasonable fee. I don't like that, um, because you're kind of bullying them into it. Um, I like, you know, third-party verification, which is, here's what other appraisers pay. It's somewhat complicated to do because sometimes you run into situations where specifically, you know, like we're on a flat fee and we run into situations where certain market areas, you know, we lose money initially and then we have to adjust the client's fee, but it's probably the cleanest way. Um, the six criteria is to dot Frank um, at the time of assignment, which is competency. I don't know all six, but um, off the top of my head, but I'll email you those. Um, those have to be required and then how do you handle complex assignments how do you handle volume discounts so for example is like we have staff appraisers um, you know they're on salary so they're not they're, they don't get paid per assignment per se and so that needs to be documented volume discounts you know um, as far as if um, there's specifics to uh, you know a certain amount of volume you meet certain tier structures and stuff how do you how do you uh, factor those in? And then uh, complex assignments. So what considers a change of circumstance? What is considered that? How do you handle that? All these documents. Common sense will get you so almost only so far on this, and documentation will only get you so far. You actually need a process. You actually need, you need uh, some type of technology solution process. Some type of you know, database to do most of this stuff when it comes to customary reasonable fees. A policy alone, again, I'm not a regulator, but a policy alone will probably not be enough um, from what I've experienced. Mandatory reporting, this is big. Um, so one of the requirements of the Dodd-Frank is mandatory reporting of um, violations. How do you manage that? And then how many how many referrals in the past 12 months or 24 months have you had? That's really simple, straightforward. If it's zero, there's an issue because something's going on. 
Not all the time is a violation, but you're just required to report anything, suspicious activity and something like that. If it's zero, there's an issue. The exclusionary and do not use list. So you need a policy for this, you need procedures for this, and then um, you need a way of monitoring managing this. This is a bear. Like this is a pain because um, you know the investors do not use list. They, you know, city has an approval list. Some of them have the do not use list. You know, um, Flagstar has this online thing, and it's actually very difficult to do because they have incomplete information too. So you want to have a way of monitoring and checking. We have a team that does this pretty much all the day, all the time. Um, that just goes through the spreadsheets, merges them all, and then checks them against the other ones. And then we have some logic built in to try to match names and stuff like that. But there's thousands and thousands and thousands of appraisers on these things. Um, so that's from an investor standpoint. Okay, now from a client standpoint, what triggers a appraiser to be put on a do not use list? And that's somewhat complicated because there's a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's service level, sometimes it's complaints sometimes it's you know it could be anything and you need a policy and procedure and also a process for that and one of the things that we do is um, every time there's an issue with a call with an appraiser that whether he's outside the service level agreement whether he gets a multiple revisions we have triggers for multiple value rebuttals we have triggers for all these different things a case gets open and then we review it and decide what to do. And sometimes it's really simple that it was just a miscommunication. He took 30 days on the appraisal because of the borrower or the realtor or just there's some confusion. Sometimes it's a lot more complicated where the appraiser, you know, we have a case now we're dealing with where, you know, um, the appraiser thinks that he did something right. The client thinks he did something wrong. They're both in hissy fits about it big time. And we've got to kind of be a voice of reason. You know, most of the time they get dismissed relatively easily, but if there's a clear violation, what do you do? Um, the appraiser qualifications board has a level of violations, one, two, three, four, you can Google it, that really clearly spell out various violation levels with recommended punishment. That's a great starting place. And what we do is, you know, if the appraiser has clear violation that's not a photos of the property and he inflated the value by 100 that's an immediate remove no problem documentation email you know send a letter done refer man reporting done but when you get in these gray areas you really do need to have a process and one of the best ways is just a probation period where we think there's something wrong we're going to put your file your fault your, your profile on hold for five days as a as a suspension as a, as a suspension or you know for 30 days you're going to be on probation and then after 30 days on probation, if you do well, you're fine. But if you do something that's questionable within that 30 days, uh, you go to you go to suspension. You get suspended for five days. And if it's not if you if you do something after that, you're back on probation for 30 days, and then you get removed from the panel. Um, that's all documented, emailed, lettered, really simple, um, and it's, it's found to work well. I think a lot of lenders. And appraisal management companies, and we've been guilty of this too, is do a bad job of communicating back to the appraiser um, what their expectations are as well as what is a good way um, to do business with them and how they're doing. One of the great things that we've implemented is a, is a weekly feedback and a scorecard which helps appraisers know what they're doing, where they are against their peers. And it's really for um, the little tightly or managed clients and, and investors and appraisers, but it just makes a difference. Here's feedback. If you continue going down this path, you're going to be put on probation. If you don't approve your turn on time, if you don't approve your revisions, if you don't start providing better service levels, um, you're going to be put on probation, and it's very, very clear. Uh, the the Black and white violations of false photos and inflated values and things like that. That's a little easier because you can just remove them and send them a letter, but the gray ones is where you do need a process in place. The reviewing appraisals, um, 
policies and procedures, appraiser and independence communication. I know it gets a little touchy. Reviewer qualifications, so minimum qualification for appraisers, coordinators, training, you know, use PAC regulatory background check, uh, quality assurance review of reviewers, the 10%, the grading of reviewers, that all needs to be a part of the process. Uh, there are several states that require USPAP training for you to be able to assign an appraisal. You really got to look at that. So I think Utah is one of them and there's a couple others, but um, that's a big deal. Um, same thing with just what the appraisal comes in, what does it go through? How do you do the 10% review? Who verifies this information? It's very, very important. Uh, the depth of the review, so the risk-focused approach, the scope of work, how do you handle change in value, how do you validate information on the appraisal's message, assumptions, and data sources. Um, so something like how do you verify change in value, how do you verify the information on the appraisal is correct, uh, what do you assume is correct, what data sources do you have available, maybe that's a platinum data delusions or or Logic, or uh, Zillow, or whatever, you, and I know you guys use it, so it's, it's I accept you for who you are. Um, what do you use and what do you do to do that? It's very important to, to have those in place. Uh, we're going to go hello, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Resolution of deficiencies. So when there is something wrong, what is the criteria for a new appraisal? How do you log it? How do you document it? How do you track and monitor communication? So if somebody ever came back, Okay, now again, you got to put this whole piece of pile together. You would have clear lines of appraisal independence. You would have clear ways of knowing that the appraiser is competent to do the appraisal. You would have boarded the appraiser properly, know he's in good standing. You would assign the appraisal to a competent appraiser who did the work in a professional manner that was in good standing and that did the work competently. You would review the file properly. Any issues with the file, you would have logged, you document, so you can go all the way back and figure out exactly what went wrong and exactly what went right so there are no questions. There is no gray area. Uh, documentation of the review. Our reviews, we do a lot of documentation associated with the review as far as um, I've seen you guys have seen our C data checklist. Um, our reviewers take internal notes and gradings that you do not see um, that go into what they think of the appraiser, what they think the appraisal did, what my phone's ringing, sorry guys, um, what they think the appraisal did well, let um, what they think the appraiser did well, what they think the appraiser didn't do well. Um, it's very, very important and then this, this appraiser gets scored that goes into a profile. So if you ever came back and said, show me this review, we would have something on that. Some of them are a lot, some of them are a little, all of them have something. Um, and that's very important because they just need to verify. If somebody comes back three, four years later, they need to verify that what you did made sense in context of your current system and current environment. AMC state licensing, this is just really a question for your AMCs. How do you proactively monitor and comply with state laws and state licensing and review appraisals? There's certain appraisers that um, do require um, that do require uh, certain states that do require you have licensed appraisers. I know Nevada is one of them, I think California is one of them, um, North Carolina, and don't I have a list of these specifically, but how do you do them? How do you monitor it? One of the big things is the state licensing regulations, kind of hard to deal with. Um, they're kind of popping up. There's no centralized resource. Um, there's an AMC regulatory uh, thing that we subscribe to that does a pretty good job of it. And a lot of appraisal management companies have been using, you know, um, just kind of, monitoring the state websites and the various state websites to try to come up with this is important to know um, and also uh, proactively do it. The states have not, it's all new legislation so there is a little delay and sometimes the states don't have their stuff together processing the orders and stuff like that but you just want to make sure that um, 
you want to make sure that your AMC that you are dealing with uh, has all licenses. There's not that many AMCs that have their national licenses. I mean, relatively to lenders, I mean, there's not that many lenders that have a license in all 50 states. There's just not that many AMCs, probably around in the 200 range um, that have all licenses and state requirements, which is really not that much considering the number of banks and lenders that service. Um, so you want to make sure they have them all. And some of them are just unaware of it um, because it, the states don't do that good a job and there's not really a central resource. The appraisal institute have done a decent job. They're not really a central resource for them to go and get the information. You've kind of got a, got a guerrilla warfare where you can just go to all the state websites. Um, or there's a service you simply subscribe to, but it's it's not expensive, but it's just something you got to do. Uh, general business policies, information security, social security, business continuity, third party fraud. This is real stuff. This is like probably stuff you already have for your third party. But the goal is to, you know, kind of stuff on top of all of that. And so what I want to do is just really quickly review this about one minute. And then we're going to go probably 10 minutes for questions. Um, and then you can email me with, with any uh, specific questions that you have. So appraisal independence is the first thing. So you want to make sure the appraisers are independent, make an individual assessment. Then you want to make sure the selection of the appraisers is accurate, um, that the appraiser you selected is, is, is good. He's the best appraiser to do this that you know of and that you have a, a way of doing that. That the engagement letter that you send to the appraiser is compliant and reflective of your business process. You have the, all the appraiser qualifications. Your appraiser is geographically competent. You factored into customary reasonable fees. You have a way of monitoring the mandatory reporting, the exclusionary list. When the appraisal comes back, you review the file, and it's in compliance. Real simple in theory. Uh, but again, so we'll open up some questions. Let me... Um, so one of the things is, yes, we will make slides available. Um, six criteria of um, the, the really the really only question, what are the six criteria referred to order of appraisal and Dodd Frank? Um, I'm going to email that out because I, it's kind of buried in. Um, but there are six specific criteria that go into um, what is required of the appraisal um, for the Dodd Frank. Um, so it's definitely something that uh, I'll, I'll get together and, uh, and I'll email out. But um, I'm just going to send out to everybody. One of one of the questions they have is is what should you look for in a third-party provider? Now, that's a really good question um, because that's not an easy question. Um, I will say there was an article published in, and I'll send it out, in MBA News Link last week that I wrote, um, or this week that I wrote, regarding that specific thing. And what the thesis was is that Appraisal management software is just not enough, and that's very, very true. Um, the software itself is not enough to make you compliant. There needs to be processes in place. Um, most AMCs that use a third-party software, there's only probably 20 AMCs that have their own software. They're probably significantly better. Um, they use some type of third-party software. It's very difficult because there's a lot of custom business rules and custom business processes that they have to account for that um, are hard to do without a full development team. Um, so that's definitely something that you want to uh, consider. Generally speaking, and don't do this, but if you sent them this slideshow and checklist, um, they should have answers to these really easily. If they do not, you've got a major problem. Um, and you might want to start looking at another third-party provider. If they do, and there's a lot of good AMCs and good companies out there, 
you're probably in a pretty good place. There's a lot to this. Now, here's something you got to remember, too. There's a lot to this, and this is all new. So a lot of these things um, we're really just figuring out, and we're really just starting to know. And so it's difficult because uh, it's difficult because uh, it's not that easy to become compliant with something. Something like as simple as exclusionary list uh, took us five months of development to really monitor and have a software system to be able to do that. And it's pretty complicated, you know, kind of factors and stuff like that. So you really want to um, you really want to look at it in depth. And I would generally lean towards an AMC or third-party provider that has own software. For lenders that are managing the process in-house, you've got a lot of work to do. And what that work is is all this. Um, you basically need the only thing you're exempt from, for the most part, is the AMC state licensing. Everything else needs to be exactly like it is. Um, so that's very touchy. It's a lot of work. Most lenders, to be very honest, do not do what is required or what is needed. Just generally speaking, case by case, maybe a little different, but generally speaking, and it's really because you don't know, you haven't had enough time. There's a lot of factors. You're not in the appraisal business. I mean, there's a lot of AMCs in this either, so that's not necessarily bad. It's just a lot of work. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you guys for, for attending. Uh, my email, for people who want to email me any questions, and I'm just going to give it to you now, is uh, B Coaster C-O-E-S-T-E-R, at Coaster, C-O-E-S-T-E-R, V-M-S.com. Let me just type a message out B. Um, so I will be, I, I will not, but somebody from my staff will be sending out a copy of this as well as the slides and the webinar link. And then if you have any questions, you can just email me directly. And if I can't get back to you, I'll definitely have somebody will. Um, you know, thank you guys so much. I hope you, you learned something on this. These things are always, you know, uh, interesting. I usually, we usually get very good feedback on these. So thank you guys. And thank you for being a client or you know, a, uh, in the mortgage lending business. So have a good one. Bye-bye.